Hi everybody, my name is Gary and welcome to episode 25 of Run to the Hills. This week, Eddie and I will have a catch up and chat about training goals, future podcast guests and some other bits and bobs we've been up to. Hi Eddie, how are you? Good, thank you. It is a bit of a bit, bits and bobs podcast, isn't it? But we've got some we've got some business to see to first, haven't we? Before we get really stuck into this, um, into the next few episodes. So, and we've got some exciting interviews lined up, which we're going to talk about in a bit. But um, first, how's the running? How's the training? How is Blighty? Has the has the storm and the snow that everyone went on and on about passed? We, well, we're in half term now, uh, <laughs> which is which is good. Um, but we, yeah, last week, my goodness, me, the uh, wind and the rain and the it was so cold. But then over a 24 hour period we've gone from like minus 10 in ice rain to about eight or nine degrees so all the snow pretty much where we live anyway has gone and um it's i was roasting this morning i went out with the dog for a few miles and i was stripping off i had a jacket on to start off with but uh yeah it's pretty nice now what about yourself i thought you northerners just ran in shorts Shorts, and a bare yeah. chest oh, yeah, all, all most year of the, the time, world. don't you? <laughs> all year round, it'll be short, but uh, yeah, I don't like my arms getting cold. <laughs> and my head, there's not much on top, so I try. Maybe a little it. cap. How's the running? We didn't talk last week about what you're sort of aiming for this year. and Well, yeah, uh, it is Bob Graham rounds. Um, that is the kind of main focus. A few of the races have been rescheduled so i've had to cancel one of them i was down for the dark skies event which is trail outlaws and it's it's around keel the reservoir um but with kind of covid and, and stuff like that they've rescheduled that to the end of may which unfortunately was the week before mm. the bob graham round attempt so i'm not going to do that i've also got the st cuthbert's way uh ultra 100k and that's quite interesting actually it's a uh, race the tide it used to start at holy island and run oh, to I've Melbourne. seen it i think i've seen that on country file did oh, um wow. did um did uh what's his name do it you know do you remember i used to love it when i was younger what was it with the two guys that were the soldiers robson oh, and green yeah 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 he does the fishing now doesn't he robson one of them did it i'm sure i remember seeing it yeah so tell me about it well yeah it used to be holy island to melrose i could be wrong on that but then they flipped it now um and you literally have to race the tide because holy island has a causeway which is over a mile long and um if you don't get there on time you aren't allowed to get to holy island or you've got to wait for ages until the tide goes out again so that's quite interesting that i'm not too sure when that so is that the finish so you're running to there yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what happens if you get there and it, do runners get there and then they're like, no, you. But well, this is the first it. year they've done it. This is the first year they've oh, done okay. it. Okay. That, that, that direction. Um. So I don't know. I don't know what happens. So you you predict your time. I think they set you off in waves. This was all pre-COVID. It could totally change the kind of format now. Yeah. Um, because they might have to stagger times to kind of keep social distancing. Um. But the format was you all start at a. You see, you're going to do it in 14 hours under or whatever time. And then that determines on when you set off. And hopefully, if all goes well, you get to Holy Island when the tide's out. It's quite common where we live in the summer, especially. You'll just see some, uh, I don't want to be too harsh, but somebody in a car who's halfway across the causeway having to call out the Coast Guard because they're just stranded, <laughs> which is pretty crazy. So you can go out there by car? Yeah, yeah. You, you, like you get a window when the tide goes out and there's a little hut about halfway. So if you do get caught out, this little kind of sanctuary you can take refuge in. Um, but it's really common. My goodness, you just see it so often people taking a chance and the tide comes in pretty quick. Uh, before you know it, your kind of your wing mirrors are underwater and stuff like that. It's, uh, yeah, it sounds it's, like you're speaking from experience. No, 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 no. <laughs> I've witnessed it. Yes, I have witnessed <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> but it's good. Yeah, but about yourself? Oh, sorry, no. I mean, might both have London. Um, if that comes well, of around. course. Yeah. And, I'll book in Valencia Marathon, so a bit of sunshine, if that goes ahead too. Oh, when is Valencia? Is that September-ish? December. Later. I think it's December. So December, yes, it's a late one, isn't it? But it's, it's fast. Super fast. Lots. I think the half marathon world record is Valencia, so 
hopefully we were supposed to do it last year and everything got cancelled obviously um so fingers crossed we get to go ahead for this year and that's what, some... what's your marathon pb she said nonchalantly <laughs> my marathon <laughs> it's 254 and 14 seconds something like that so it's okay. yeah i think it's about that it's on it's on oh, let's what's just yours? say what's yours? 251 uh, oh, those days are gone for me though I'm i think gonna... my days are gone too <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll be on uh, London. You'll be championship start with that kind of pace. While I'll be good for age, so we won't be in the. Same no, place. I don't want to go championship start. I want to go with my mates in the good for age right, and then. run around. I'd like a sub three. I'd like yeah. a sub three. That That's would be it. good. But oh, also, I'd just like to be on a start line with my mates. And if it ends up being a run around party, <laughs> I'm well happy. I think it's too. hard. You know, you'd be the same. You train like on the trails a lot. And I'm um, trying to do the speed work and the elevation. It's it's really hard to kind of do everything. So yeah, three hours would be a goal. I've got this like a long term goal of running the Boston Marathon when I'm 50. So I do need to keep a little mm. toy in mm. running quick. But um, yeah, three hours of London would be nice. It's just if you're having a good day, it's such a fantastic marathon. Good. And yourself? Actually, well, I've got i I have a um, oof, I have a hundred and ten k with seven thousand meters of elevation in meters May. Right. Yeah, the Maxi Annecy race. Um, but uh, they keep sending emails saying mm, yeah, we hope we hope to go ahead, but I I can't see it. And also, I'm really enjoying this winter. I committed to doing a big change in my training because I've always run here through the winter. A little bit less volume, but I've pretty much carried on my run training. And this year I've halved my run training. So normally I do about uh, about between 10 and 14 hours a week, let's say. And then this year I've done like five hours a week running, which for a runner is mind-blowingly hard. Yeah. But you really make these decisions. So I was like, right, no. Every, all, all the French good trail runners... On, in the winter they're on the skis and there's a reason that they then do really well in the summer and it's taken me a few years to like come on be brave enough to step out of your trainers I'm sure and put your skis on. Some ski moors, isn't he, during the winter Can you yeah exactly anyone you know they're all doing these crazy things at mountains I'm not quite that crazy but I have committed to doing a lot more volume on my skis and so um the race in may i think even if it does happen it's going to be a bit too early because i want to just carry it now i started yeah. and i can see the progression and i can see i'm getting stronger and i'm still doing two or three really hard running sessions a week but every week i'm like wow i'm actually making progression and going a little bit faster which I don't know about you, but it's been a few years since I've actually really seen really big progressions yeah, in yeah. my training. And it's definitely from going to do something different. And I put a lot more biking in. I know I've gone on about that, but it's again, it's taken me a few years to be like, it's okay to bike yeah. and not to run. It equals the same. And actually it's almost better than just that second. You're not especially when you're, you. Yeah. As we get older. Yeah. And I've always, and I now I'm, I'm quite fit on the bike now, so I can do a good session. And I'm also quite like, if, if I do get injured or something, or the weather's awful, or, well, you know, the kids are at home, I can jump on the bike and I'm fit enough to have a really good session. Yeah. Whereas before, I'd only ever ride my bike under duress and when I was injured. <laughs> and so it wasn't that productive. But now I'm like, okay, I can get on it and actually really do and some would good you, stuff. Would so, you like be a similar workout like tonight? I mean, it's just Mine might be, say, five times five minutes. Would that be a similar thing on the bike? Um, yeah, pretty similar. Bike and run, you can pretty much... Um, the heart rate on the bike is just a little bit lower because it's non-weight bearing. But yeah. once, especially because I've done a load of cycling in my triathlon career, I can tell the perceived exertion of where I should be yeah. for that, how that five minutes feels running and how that five mil minutes feels on the bike. So I do this, so I'm doing a lot of power on the bike because the skiing up the hill is so slow. I mean, <laughs> when it's really, really steep. Um, so you're kind of like, it's basically, so then on the bike, I go and cycle. I'm doing yeah. the, to get the legs spinning and to get the power. Um, yeah, so I'm really enjoying doing different stuff and being outside and challenging myself because nothing is really, 
pieced here because they haven't opened up the okay. resort. And so you ski up and you're like, let's just see what <laughs> happens. Can I get down this? Um, so, yeah, so I'm thinking May might be a little bit early for race, but I have my sort of one big focus this year. There's an eight day stage race that's literally up the mountain out the window behind me is at the top of the mountain up there eight days um so that i love a multi-day have you done oh, a multi-day gary yes, i really enjoy the multi-day i like the social side of it i think um, yeah a couple i did i did the south and north peaks um and you slept on the village hall in ideal at the beginning of the, the spine race a lot of people actually were training for the spine and they used that as an event uh, that's a really good i never knew that one they still run that one yeah, yeah, well, Maybe probably not. Last year. <laughs> I <laughs> love them because I always see them as a li the, the treat of doing like a really nice, a really long run and then getting back and being able to go, I'm just going to lie down yeah. in your tent or in a sports hall. I'm going to eat all the food and I'm going to talk to people and I don't have to move. <laughs> and then I just going to eat all this food and lie here and then I'm just going to get up and do it again and someone else is going to carry my bag and... Yeah. I and, and yeah, I just love the meeting and the, the pain, sharing that pain train with people. And and you make friends like for life who because you've just spent three or four days with them going through this. It's like a little bubble. So if you've never done a multi day, do it. Right. Let's, so let's talk about what we've got lined up for the next few oh. weeks. Oh, it's exciting. Turn the page. Here we go. Right. Yeah, we've got some uh, interviews lined up with Jason and Kim. Cavill from Cavill Coaching. Um, so that should be interesting to catch up with those guys. I've done a few races with Jason, but I've only seen him for about a couple of hundred meters. And then he's. <laughs> I'm really good. They actually came out, I think it must have been three years ago, and they came and stayed with us for a month in their mobile home out on our drive. Oh, fantastic. Um, oh, we had such a good time. It was great. And they learned to ski. Jason was crazy. Yeah. He took, put, he put um, the skinniest, lightest skis you can imagine. And I followed him down. Going, oh my God. Oh my God. Uh, um, bike, isn't he? I think he used to ride yes. It. Yes. He's a re he was a very good mountain biker. So I'm looking forward to catching up, seeing how their coaching is going. Um, and also seeing what the plans are for this year. I think Jason was planning on coming back to have another crack at the spine if you don't know his story he was yeah. closing in last year wasn't he on first place with 40 miles to go and then had a terrible shin injury which I think has taken him a long long time to recover so I'm looking forward to finding out how they are and what their plans are and grilling them on a few few little tips for for training over the next few months getting us race ready yeah. i'm sure they've got um, a series of um like strength and conditioning videos of, like, they've got really good videos yeah, yeah kim's yeah. really good on um on those and they were always um jason coached me for a couple of years and, they, and he was i loved it because he was really good on the strength and conditioning putting it into sessions which i'm 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 hard on <laughs> i love that too uh next week you've got a couple of interviews lined up too yeah, we've got, uh, we're hoping we're going to have Sabrina Bajee on the show. So, um, you know, my goodness me, she doesn't need any introduction. Um, any questions for Sabrina, it'd be re really good if you wanted to reach out to us um, and we'll pick those out and put them to her. That would be interesting. We've also got an interview with a, a friend of mine actually called Angie Andrews, and she has got a new book out. I've got it here. Um, oh, you've got it. Running in the Mid-Pack. Have you read it? Well, audio book. I've read it. I've, I've listened to it. Um and yeah, it's really good, actually. It's kind of something for everybody. There's uh, something we can all relate to and some, you know, a bit more kind of detailed training and a lot of the psychology about enjoying your running. So that is good. And she's also, yeah, she's a host on Marathon Talk. She's, she fills in every now and again. So you may have already heard her. I'm also trying to... Um get hold of well arrange an interview with the free to run charity which is all about getting women in empowering women in afghanistan to run um set up by stephanie case lots of people will know her from um her tour de jean experiences and um and so we're just trying to sort out we got the internet's not great in afghanistan so we might have to wait a few weeks until um until we can get that interview but i'm really excited about having a chat with her and seeing what the run to the hills listeners can do to support that charity as well That's you have been busy in the background as well gary doing all sorts of good things that i just just oh. you you set up a uh strava club i've joined yes and, and I think I tell me about it i turned it on um, so i set this up i didn't 
advertise it at all. Um, and I went for a run with my friend of the, the weighted hike that I do on a Sunday. And Neil, uh, he said, oh, I've, I've joined your Strava club. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and I didn't, didn't realize, but I think Strava just tells people you've done things um, if they're in your kind of list of, of followers. Um, so I popped it on the Run to the Hills Facebook page. And then I think, last time I checked, there was probably about 90 people. Um, Let's get on there. And some big miles, <laughs> over 100 miles. Could, I, really? It's quite staggering, yeah. Do you like Strava, Gary? Do you use it like no. competitive? <laughs> no, I used to be. I used to get wrapped up in the I mean, mileage challenges and I'd just be doing stuff I shouldn't be doing. Like for training for, say, a, a marathon and I'd be going out again at nine o'clock at night because somebody had knocked me down a position on the monthly mileage challenge um so I, I do everything syncs up on strava so yes you know by all means um follow me on strava i'll, I'll i'm happy to connect with people but i'm not really i don't really use it like that I, I tend to my stuff goes on garmin connect if i bother to kind of give stuff a title and things like that but yeah i'm on strava um and it's it's fantastic just to just to see what people are out there doing and um mm-hmm. it could be on a treadmill you know if the conditions don't allow it or out there on the streets um up mountains it's like i say some of the runs that people have done this past uh few days really staggering i, 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 I like connecting the people because you know you recognize the names from the facebook group and then you see them on strava and then you can yeah. see oh that's what you're doing or <laughs> oh you're rapid or oh my gosh you've just run yeah, yeah. 100k you crazy I, crazy fool i had to double check if it was if i'd got my kilometers and miles muddled up because i just thought no way if people ran that amount of uh, distance in a week but yeah well done everybody that's pretty pretty good and thanks for yeah thanks for joining up appreciate that We've also set up, I mean, we've been terribly busy this week. We've set up an Instagram page uh, at Run to the Hills with Cheer Charge. Um, I haven't done much to promote it yet, so I thought I'd sort of wait and talk about it on the podcast first. But um, we'll, we'll be try and be active on there and post um, various pictures of me in the hills, sweating profusely, crying a bit. I, I went, I did a massive treadmill uphill run session yesterday morning race to get the kids to the ski slopes and then I thought oh, I've got my skis I might as well do like my recovery session going up the hill who thinks that that is a good idea I don't know and I said to one of the kids can you pop a snack in my backpack yeah 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 mum yeah 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 let me just Whoa. finish this I got to the top two hours later I was like I am dark the low blood sugar was beyond vision blurry like yeah. I was like oh my god where's the snack I got all my like rucksack <laughs> open on this like 2100 meter peak Where's the snack? It's like it's not in there. It's no snack. There's no snack in there. Nothing, so then nothing. I, there was nothing. There was nothing. There was water. That's not. It's not good enough. And I was like, oh my god. And then it's a long. This one climb I do. It's three. It's one thousand two hundred meters up. So it's a long ski. Then to, and I had the proper shakes of like oh, oh. such. I was like, let the crep hut be open. Let yeah. the crep hut be, please. I just. I'm just gonna lie across the thing, going crep. It wasn't open, but um, we digress. But that would have been a funny Instagram story. Too. I always have good when I, I used to cycle home. I used to cycle to work years ago, and um, quite often I'd get this the, the bonk, whatever it was. Um, oh, and I'd literally it, yeah. just fly straight into a petrol station and buy a Snickers or something like that. Oh, it's terrible. It's terrible, isn't it? You're just like your whole body is like Coke, yeah. sugar. I just need that child that didn't put the snack in got short shrift but then said child had to wait 40 minutes in the van for the other one to finish and we had a serious sugar uh low so i was like we're we both we're both in the same place <laughs> so anyway we thought for our competition this week that we would um we would do it via our new instagram page um we're both <sighs> you're much better with technology than i am but I we know. thought um that what we'd like you to do this week is give us a follow on our instagram it's at run to the hills with cheer charge and then just uh write a comment below um the post i'm going to put um with why you should win the new vegan cheer charge bars uh, we are both yet to sample these bars but tim has told us that they are delicious um so if you would like to win a sample pack of those vegan bars uh i shall post a picture of 
yet to be decided. It should be the vegan bars, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then just uh, give us a follow and tag yourself why you why you would why you not deserve because everybody deserves a, a cheer shot by why you want them. Be grabby. I think it's amazing. You know, even if you're not a, a vegan, you know, I'm not a vegan. Um, but if you can enjoy something as much and you've not kind of had any negative impact on uh, animals, then, uh, then, 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 yeah, then why not? My daughter, she, she tries to be vegan. vegan. Um, what, what is, what's uh, Achilles heel? Eggs, yeah, she does eat eggs. So. Yeah, and it's important for kids as they're growing as well. Yeah. That I am a vegetarian and I do eat a lot of veganish meals, but I also find the protein side hard to yeah i kind of just try and listen to my body rather than going well no you can't eat that because mm -hmm. you're i kind of really try and just listen and go what does it what does it crave and your body's yeah. clever isn't it it tends to be like i want this and so i think I that's really important it, yeah really we'll important relationship the, we'll put a link in the show notes to the strava uh, yes uh, well you will be um the strava the instagram and we'll put it all on facebook because a lot most people are on the facebook now Hi everybody, today I'll be chatting with Melanie Horan and Ian Richardson from the Northeast Marathon Club. Uh, hi guys, could you introduce yourself and tell everyone a bit about you? Uh, ladies first, Mel. Hi, I'm Mel from Northeast Marathon Club. I've been running for about 12 years and doing marathons for about 10. Uh, I've done over 100 marathons and I've lost track now. Um, that's about all about me. Um, I'm Ian, I'm one of the founders of the Northeast Marathon Club. Um, started running... Oh, too long ago, really. Did my first marathon in 1970, 1997, I beg your pardon, not that long ago. <laughs> Another 260 of them now, and a bit like Mel, I'm, uh, I'm not necessarily counting them all now. I think that's good when you, like, crack, like, a milestone. I think I did a hundred, kind of forgot all about 2020, I think in 2019, but it was nice to do that. And then, yeah, you just, you, I'm, I'm not counting them anymore. It's, it's quite nice. Um, yeah, when, I suppose... Did you uh, start, I suppose, taking running serious or even further back from that? Have you got like a conscious memory of when you started to run? You know, Well, I didn't run at all when I was in school or any time until I was about 30. I went to the gym and stuff through my 20s, but I didn't have any interest in running outside. It was really when I had children that I started to run. And then when I had the third one, Daisy, um, I decided to do the Great North Run to get fit again after I'd had her. So I ran my first Great North Run when she was 20 weeks old. And then after that, I decided, oh, I might as well do a marathon now. And that's where it all began. Oh, cool. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, some similarities, I guess. I, I was uh, never sporty at all at, at school. And in my mid-30s, I started going to a gym. It was a very basic gym and had one treadmill in it. Uh, and I got quite quite familiar with using that and found it quite enjoyable, but it would break. And I had no idea what to do when it had an out of order sign on it. And somebody said to me, why don't you just go and run outside? Yeah. And it had never, ever crossed my mind that I could go and run outside. Yeah. So I did, really enjoyed it. Did a charity 10K that a guy from the gym had got me involved with at Whitley Bay. Didn't have a watch on, didn't even have any pins for the number. I had no idea what on earth I was doing. Sure. And then after doing... 10Ks and half marathons for quite a while. It was just this thing thinking, well, there's these things called marathons out there. Best have a go at one of those. <laughs> and although it was appallingly hard work and, and I, I did go through the wall, yeah. um, I just got hooked straight away. Fantastic, yeah. And um, so, yeah, talking about marathons, what, I know Ian, you said you're one of the founding members uh, with the Marathon Club, but yeah, Melly, how did you stumble across the Marathon Club? Well, it was when I'd done the Great North Run and I saw the Town Moor Marathon advertised somewhere. It might have been on the Future Northeast races. And I thought, oh, I didn't realise there was a marathon in Newcastle. So I went along and everyone was really friendly and I found out it was the Northeast Marathon Club. So yeah. I joined that straight away, basically, and then ca carried on. Did you, I, myself, when I found the Marathon Club, initially I thought, oh my goodness, I could never... I could never join a, a, a marathon club. Were you kind of apprehensive at first? Or you were you just like, no, no, this is going to be fantastic? Or? 
I suppose because I went straight from not really doing any running to running a half marathon, then a marathon, I didn't really know about the competitive element to running. I didn't realize that people all did 5Ks and 10Ks and I was supposed to do that before I ran a marathon. I just went in at the deep end and everyone was so friendly in the marathon club. The competitive thing didn't really come up until later on. Right. Yeah, you're right. And Ian, yeah, what, um, I suppose, inspired you to start a marathon club? Well, it, it was because at the time, bear in mind, the Marathon Club is only just over 10 years old now, 2010 it started. But at that time, there was nothing in the area. There were no organised marathons between probably somewhere like Edinburgh and Leeds. Yeah. Um, and, and because of the dearth of that and, and the fact there was an interest in doing marathons in the northeast, we set it up. And it was with a very simple remit of putting on some events in the northeast for northeast people who are the ran marathons or aspired to running marathons yeah. but didn't want to have a, like a whole weekend away doing them yeah. and, and it just grew think, from there you know like where it is now you get people traveling kind of quite large distances to come to i don't know newcastle talmer or something like you could see somebody with a um i'm sure at the gosforth the race course there was somebody with a st, st. albans athletics club running vest on and did you ever visualise that? You know, these people from all over the country would come. I, I think not initially. I mean, when we first set up, we were very well supported by members of the 100 Marathon Club. So they, they travel a long way and they, they like to do races that are on for the first time. Um, but I think one of the particular attractions to people for the Tamua Marathon and the race course ones is that they're on, effectively on tarmac uh, yeah. entirely for the race course, mostly for the Tamua, and they were accurately measured. Yeah. which meant people could use them for things like good for age. And we had people came down to the race course from Scotland, uh, actually doing the 50K, to improve their starting position in the Comrades in South Africa. Yeah. So there, yeah. were, there were different reasons for doing it. But uh, yeah, sometimes I think as the years have gone by and we've got more and more members, uh, our name and reputation have got out and people will come from all over the place now. And as you probably know, we have a member in, uh, in Norway who uh, comes and uh, takes part in some of our events. And like you mentioned, uh, like Gosforth and places like that with the tarmac, but it isn't just tarmac, is it? You, we do have uh, the coastal marathon that kind of starts at Almouth. Uh, you used to do Hamsterley. Um, and, uh, oh my goodness, I'm trying to think of a few of the traily, traily races that we've uh, got. It's not just tarmac, excuse me, is it? No, in, in fact, they're the only ones that are. The rest are all trail because of the practicalities of putting on events. So, yeah, you've got like some Gibside and Drewridge and so on. Um, and what we try and look for is easy to manage trail stuff so yeah. that anybody can have a go at them. I think um, if anybody's looking for a spectacular run, you can't really go uh, wrong with doing the Northumberland Coastal. That is uh, pretty spectacular. For people who've never done it, uh, it's basically like 13 mile out and back for the full marathon, at least, anyway. And um, Dunsborough Castle, Craster, and places like that, it's pretty, it's pretty spectacular. But um, yeah, have you got any particular favourites, Melanie? Like the, the mar marathon club events, or it doesn't have to be marathon club, to be honest. It could be any any marathon. Well, I think Northumberland Coastal has got to be the best one, but I do love Gibside. Yeah. I think it's because I like a bit of a challenge and that's gives us a place where I first ran for 24 hours and managed to run a hundred miles with Ian's help getting me to the finish line there. Yeah. But yeah, I just love Gibside because I, you can actually just about see my house from there as well. So it's like my local run. So that was a fantastic that, yeah. that, that was brilliant with all the people, the tents and the 24 hour. It just felt for that period of time, it was a little kind of marathon bubble um, and people would just kind of come and go do a, I think it was like a relay um, thing going on with some clubs. Um, yeah, yeah, it was a pretty special day, actually. And um, yeah, what about you, Ian? I've seen some pretty spectacular photographs and my <laughs> done like over 200 yeah. marathons. I, I, th I think for the uh, North East Marathon Club one, my, my views are not tend to change depending upon my age and condition. Um, so the, 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 uh, the coastal one, certainly, and Gib Gibside was my favourite for quite a while. I think it's probably Druridge now because I find that more manageable at my vintage. Yeah. Um, but of overseas one, yeah, that, that's one of the great things about running. I mean, I, I've been going to Davos in Switzerland for something like 20 years now. Yeah. And the photograph you have of me on the top of a mountain, which Melanie's convinced is a green screen uh, <laughs> presentation and not real at all, uh, was nearly 3,000 metres up and that was doing a... Uh, a 50 mile event which is one of the most special things I've ever done but normally I do a I've done a trail event there of uh, 42k 
Yeah. Um, but I've had the, the, the bonus as well of being able to travel chunks of the world, um, Southeast Asia, particularly Greenland a few years ago, wow. doing marathons there. And they're all utterly special in their own way. And have you got any, uh, both of you, any particular events that, you know, maybe, you know, you probably would do again, but you just came out or came away from it thinking, my goodness me, that was horrendous or brutal. It could have been the weather, the elevation, or the terrain or whatever. I know if Melanie's got a, got anything other than a vest on, it's a pretty cold day. So, uh, yeah, anything from you know. <laughs> It was this terrible time where Ian made me go to Nottingham to do a race around, what was it, a boating lake? And it was yeah, the it was worst experience of my life. <laughs> <laughs> there was nothing wrong with it. It was a flat race going round and round this lake, but I just, oh, it was so hard. I think it was because it was so flat, I found it so unbearable. It was just, oh, I couldn't wait for it to be finished. How big was the lake? How many laps did you have to do? Do you remember? About 5,000. <laughs> Eight, I think. Some people love that one as well, don't they? I did. Um, I ran one of those, the Enigma running ones in Milton Keynes, and that was yeah. countless times around a, a reservoir um, in Milton Keynes. But what I found weird that day, or, or, or nice actually, sorry, not weird, was um, their little community was all different people, but it was just a little mirror image of our little community up north. <laughs> it was, it was weird. It was all kind of the same personalities, but with a kind of Milton Keynes t t twist on it. <laughs> but Ian, yeah, anything from you, anything like, my goodness me, that Yeah, I've, I've done some of those Milton Keynes ones as well. I think the ones that I've, I've liked least haven't been the fault of the event, but sometimes just just me at the time. Yeah. And I've done, I remember when I first did Hell on the Humber, and I did that as a, as a lead up to the 100 marathon, so it was like filling in weekends. Uh, and it was awful, I hated every minute of it, and so I'm never going back there, constantly being nearly swept off the bridge. Um, and I thought afterwards, there's actually nothing wrong. Yeah, just back and forwards over the bridge. Forwards over the bridge. Oh. Yeah, it's two miles out, two miles back. So you can't actually do a marathon. You've got to do at least 28 miles. Uh, you get six hours for this thing. It's at night. Uh, and afterwards, oh, I'm never doing that again. I thought, I'm being really unfair on the event because there's nothing wrong with the event. Uh, like Melanie was saying about the Nottingham one, you know, people go back and do it 12 and 24 hours. And I went and did a Christmas one where a bloke ran it was about three degrees, and he ran just in a pair of Santa-type shorts, red with white trim. No shoes, no shirt, and I've, I've got like a full Santa suit on. Yeah. Uh, so it's sometimes like that. I mean, one of the ones that was a more unpleasant one, and yet it was one of the most beautiful marathons I've ever done, uh, was in a place called Bagan in Burma, or Myanmar, yeah. if you prefer, running amongst all these temples. Yeah. But I had food poisoning. And I really, really don't recommend running a marathon with food poisoning. No, I've no. never been last before. And yeah. I don't want to be last again. But no. I managed to beat the cutoff. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Wow, Burma, my goodness me, that would be amazing to run somewhere like that. It's so different. You know, you can go and do like city marathons all over the world and they're brilliant, but they're pretty similar. Uh, but to go places like that would be pretty, pretty special. I, I don't know, you mentioned earlier about how many marathons you both uh, can remember completing at least. Um, with the Marathon Club, what I always thought was great, um, you know, someone would say to you, uh, oh, Gary, you've done 50 marathons or whatever, and uh, you'd think you'd feel pretty good for a bit, and then all of a sudden you'd hear, overhear a conversation, someone has done 400 marathons. Do, do you know, I don't know if any, can you remember any Marathon Club members, what the kind of largest number of marathons anyone's completed? In the club, it's Ivan. Ivan, it was well, yeah. over, well over, Well over 400. And Gary Wade, can't remember what number he's on, but it's an awful lot. I think he's over 400 as well. Yeah. And do you know, you know, I hear this question quite a lot and I've never really kind of figured it out myself, but do, do you know why you run? What what makes you kind of keep coming back for more? Is there anything kind of significant? I definitely know the answer to that one. It's the monster munch at the end. <laughs> yeah, that always helps. <laughs> Yourself, are you anything come to mind? Um, I, I think for me, it's visualising fish and chips usually. Yeah. preferably with mushy peas but wait so uh, you, you both mentioned food there so when does that kind of kick in is it like mile 10 you start thinking about what you're going to eat afterwards night before for me <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i think i think it's all part of, of how you motivate yourself to keep going through a marathon rather than necessarily the running itself for yeah. me the running was a, a fitness and health thing and finding something i could do tolerably well um, given whilst I like a lot of sports, was never any good at them. Uh, running is something which I think is something which most of us can do. Um, and it doesn't even matter to what level. You know, as you know, a lot of the Northeast Marathon Club events, the, the winter wonder ones, aren't competitive anyway. Well, yeah. 
for some of us, they aren't competitive. Um, they're, they're just an amount of time to do whatever distance you want. It's, it's a bit of an obsession once you start. I mean, yeah. when you get that idea, or oh, maybe I could do 25 and get the bronze award that we get in the club or then oh well I've done 25 I may as well do 50 and after you've done 50 you push yourself to 100 and then when you've done 100 you start on ultras and you know it's just how far can your body actually go before you collapse I think it's amazing um I love the milestone awards in the club um just a like nice touch at the end of the year I know it's going to be a bit different this year with the we've got a zoom meeting planned haven't we an AGM zoom meeting so it'll be a bit different this year but what would be, you know, assuming, I don't know if you do, like follow any structured training or anything like that, and not, you know, injuries, oh, you know, if you've not got any injuries, what would a typical week be? Do you follow a plan or anything like that? Or you, or you, do you go out and run or just kind of see how you feel on the day? Well, if I'm at the office, I run to work and back, but I have been trying to do a bit more training now. I've been working at home a bit more and trying to get out and do some speed and hill sort of sessions but I don't have a particular thing that I have to do each week I've started yeah. to do strength and conditioning now as well because I'm falling apart a bit now I'm over 40 and a bit <laughs> of um, yoga as well because everything hurts from sitting down so much working on computers yeah what about you Ian you know assuming you're not I know you struggle at the moment with your niggly Achilles is that, is that right or it is yeah just just overuse I think it's nothing it just came on I thought for once in my life I'll be a bit sensible instead of trying to run through it uh, which I know you don't do, it just becomes chronic and then you have to stop. Yeah. Um, and thankfully, having had five miles out this morning, it looks like the three weeks rest and doing proper exercises are helping it. So it's just taken very sensibly. But I've never, ever followed a structured training plan. And I'd love to do so. I keep thinking about it. And Melanie and I were talking about this when we were starting off the strength and conditioning thing in the summer and, and doing hills and sprints and stuff like that. And I find I just prefer to go out and run for an hour and come home. Yeah. Um, the idea of going out and running for, I don't know, 20 minutes, but to the point where you're nearly sick at the end because you've been <laughs> going so fast or up and down hills, in theory sounds fine. But as soon as I'm out the front door, I think, well, I think I'll just run around Gosforth Park today. I'll go and see the Swans in Exhibition Park, yeah. something like that. And I, I, I work quite happily with not having a structure. I don't have the competitive element that I might have had 20 years ago when I was well, near your sort of age, if you like. I think having the virtual runs with the club every month or so, the same sort of time distance as we would usually have a marathon or a, a winter wonder or a six hour event has really helped me because I've had to get out the door and run those marathons. Otherwise, I think everyone will be looking at me and saying, why is she not doing it? Uh, so then you've got to keep up your mileage during the week, otherwise you can't be doing a marathon off, off yeah. nothing. I had I to do quite... some quarantine in the summer, and I thought, oh, I'll be fine as soon as I've done my two weeks. I'll just be out the door, do my marathon, no problem. I had to go home at 22 miles, which has never happened to me before. Oh yeah, I like the, I like having that. I think I mentioned it earlier in the, or in the podcast. Um, I just like to have that level of fitness, talking about why you run, just to have that level of fitness that if something does come up, you can just kind of be, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll do that. We'll go out for a long run or something like that. Um, so, yeah, that's probably why I kind of keep, keep ticking over. Anything outside of running, you know, it's, this is a running podcast and I spend most of my life talking about running, but is anything that you guys do that's completely not related to running? Any hobbies that we don't know about or anything like that? I'm just curious. Um, I do quite a lot of volunteering for the Scouts in Newcastle, so that's wow. taken up quite a lot of my time in the evenings at the moment. We've got a virtual platform thing set up for everyone to join Zoom meetings and organising different speakers and different things for the children to go to just to keep them occupied while they can't go to school. Can you do, uh, we, George, my son, he's a Scout, and we they did a Scouts camp at home, and I think they're organising another one again soon, so it's like a, a Zoomy. We all camp, but then we kind of Zoom activities dur during the day. It's brilliant. What about yourself? Are you anything outside of running? Uh, yeah, I, I guess my major interest that uh, could, probably couldn't get any further away from running uh, to is uh, Freemasonry. Okay. It's something I've been doing for 37 years. Yeah. Sounds awful when you say it like that. <laughs> and, and as with the running thing, of course, you can't meet up anymore. Yeah. So we have, we have Zoom uh, social get-togethers. And some of the, the things I was doing last year, partly for motivation, generally were fundraisers. Um, the thing is, doing, I did 20 marathons in 12 months and raised something like a thousand pounds that way. Uh, yeah. And I've got another set of activities coming up in the next few months, which is trying to have marathon distance runs, visiting various Masonic halls and taking photographs just yeah. to keep people amused because it's the nearest we're going to get to going there for quite some yeah. time. I was going to do a, 
a McDonald's breakfast run, but you're Masonic <laughs> Walk. You're Much more interesting. Well, it depends on your audience, I suppose. But. <laughs> and do, yeah, do, do you, I know this is a podcast, but do you listen to anything when you run, or you, you, you know, you just listen to your kind of feet hit the ground, or other podcasts, or music, anything like that? I've got a bit of an obsession with marathon talk. I love to listen to that on a on a long yeah. run. I like um, Every now and again, we get treated. Angie comes on, doesn't she? So that's quite nice. So um, hopefully, we've got Angie coming on this podcast to talk about the book that she's just uh, published. So that'll be that's really exciting. I, I don't normally, if I'm out just running generally, because I like to be aware of what's going on, because I, I know that you know you can zone out and find yourself running across a road in the path of a car. But if I don't say lapped events like around the town moor where you need the motivation to go across the flatlands of the moor when the wind's howling across it. Um, usually by the second half of an event, I'll, I'll be listening to music. Yeah. Um, the B-52 around the last one. Any favourites? Any Megadeth or Slayer or anything like that? <laughs> well, I, I was listening to the B-52s going around the last event for an album's worth, and then uh, Delaney and Bonnie for an album's worth. And I had a friend of mine put a whole load of stuff on a, an iPod for me, which I put on shuffle, so it could be you just never know what's going to come the next time yeah. round. And of course, if you don't like, you just move on the next tune. Again, it doesn't have to be about running, but any books, any books that you've uh, remember reading, doesn't have to be recent, but a particularly good book that you think uh, the listeners might be interested in. Well, I've just finished Angie's book, which I was very excited to yeah. get hold of, but I think that's probably one of the first running books I've ever read. Yeah. So I'd yeah. be interested in what everyone else has to say about that. Yeah, I, I do like reading running books, but the, the sort I like aren't, aren't necessarily well-known people. It's the ones where you've got, I feel like, ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Having said that, I think one of one of my favourites, uh, which goes against what I've just said there, is uh, Scott Jurek's book, Eat and Run. So okay. you get the, the theme again of the eating and running. And, and it was really reading that uh, and another book called The China Study, that was about eight or nine years ago, which moved me away towards vegetarianism. Ah, I uh, so I haven't eaten meat since then. Yeah. Um, I did go back to eating fish, admittedly, and, yeah. and a life without cheese just isn't worth living. Um, but but that had a, quite an impact on me reading that. And other ones around the time would be um, Born to Run, yeah, uh, yeah. Chris McDougall's book. And, I really uh, fancy, like, is it Running with Sherman or something? It's uh, He rescued a, a pony, a thing. Oh, really? And yeah. Um, he's wrote a book about his relationship with that, and that sounds really interesting, actually. So I think that's on my list. Um, yeah. I think it's the guy. I'm pretty sure it's the born and run guy. Yeah. Well, Feet in the clouds is the other the other one about the um, fell runners. Yeah. That's a, an, another one. I, I, I do like reading. You know, it's preferably ordinary people just doing daft things is is really good. And do you have a either of you have like a, a, a favorite place to run in in England? Or it doesn't have to be England actually. Um, well, I'm really lucky where I live. I just live at the edge of the, the Tyne, so I can get onto trails really easily, so I can go all the way up the Tyne or the Derwent and into the countryside, like, within a couple of minutes. Yeah. So it's always nice to run around there. But I really like going to visit my mum in Portugal. She lives in the Algarve. Mm -hmm. And so when I go there, there's, there's nice runs around there as well, along the beach and around the trails there. Mm -hmm. I've even done a couple of short races there. And a virtual marathon, which I never thought I would do. Uh, I, I think overseas it'll be Switzerland, since I've been going there for 20 years. It must be really, because um, you've just got everything there. You can run on roads if you want, you can run on good gravel tracks around lakes, you can struggle up and down mountains. Um, the, the variety in the, the scenery is just tremendous. Locally, you just really just come from out the house. Uh, I don't yeah. like driving somewhere to then start and run. I like yeah. the idea of going out the front door and coming back to the front door. Yeah. So I've got Gosford Park, I've got um, Jesmond Dean, uh, and of course the, the old favourite of the town were. So uh, yeah, just make, making the most of where you live, which I think is the best for, for all of us. And have you got, um, you know, we just don't know really, to be honest, but fingers crossed we can meet and race and not virtually, but if, have you got any physical kind of in-person races entered for 2021 if all goes well? I don't think I've got any actually entered. I just have to look and see which ones have been deferred from last year. I'm sure there's here, yeah. tens, if not 20 races that I've entered that I just can't remember what I'm supposed to be doing with. Yeah, I've, I've uh, not entered anything. It doesn't seem any real point at the moment because you just don't know if they're going to be on. Um, but I have entered some daft thing at Sea York, Run York we're doing in April. Oh, I'm doing that one as well, the 13 I just, hours. Yeah, the 13-hour thing. I mean, that just seems so utterly bizarre. I don't know if you're aware of this one, are you, Gary? No, it's, no. 
you, if you start, if I remember rightly, on the hour, every hour, starting at nine in the morning and do two miles running, walking, cycling, swimming, whatever you want. Two miles, that's it. Okay. But every, on the start of every hour, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, to nine at night. So it's 13 hours where you're doing two miles that count each hour. So it's a marathon over 13 hours. It's yeah. very much a mental a mental struggle as you sit there and you're sweaty, smelly kit as the day goes by. And I just looked at this and I thought, after maybe five miles of running for the first time in three weeks, I think, I'll have a go at that. Yeah, I thought the same, but then I thought I'll add an extra challenge and I'm going to run up that um, West Road Hill every hour <laughs> just to make it a bit harder for myself, you know, because I don't like to make things easy. The Marathon Club for 2021. Um... Well, the, the, everything's postponed really is the simple answer. Um, what we intend doing uh, as, a, as a placeholder, in essence, is that every month we'll have a virtual event mm -hmm. and it will roughly mirror what would have been a real event. Um, just to keep the name alive as much as anything else, to remind people that uh, uh, the Lees is in February, for example, and Ashington is in, in March. And, and I'll have the medal, I've got the medals being made up uh, to reflect the, the locations. What I'm hoping we'll do as well as the year goes by is what we were doing a little of last year, which are challenge events and charity fundraisers. Yeah. Uh, we all know that all sorts of charities, clubs, associations, their, their income has been severely depleted in the last year. Uh, and little things we can do to help, you know, whether it's food banks, scouts, or whatever it happens to be, I think are worthwhile. And frankly, they make people feel feel better and give them more motivation to get out and do stuff. So yeah. I think we'll that's something we'll definitely be doing, even if we can't get back to running proper full events. So that's it. Thanks, guys. Uh, thanks for coming on and sharing a bit about yourself and the Northeast Marathon Club. Uh, check it out at um, oh, is it www.northeastmarathonclub.co.uk? Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, and um, yeah, check out those guys there. They do loads of stuff. Uh, predominantly northeast based, well, 100% northeast based. But, um, <laughs> they're great, and it, you know, won't break the bank. So yeah, check those out. I'm sure you won't be disappointed. Yeah, thanks. have a little chat now I was thinking I've been thinking about it all week because <clears throat> uh we go I know England is getting to the end of this lockdown and I know there's talk next week of about coming out of lockdown and people are are really at the sort of low ebbs of life motivation homeschooling we kind of know that hopefully by summertime life will be a little bit better with the vaccine and things will be opening up and hopefully races will be restarting. But we kind of thought we'd have a little chat about like, what can we do in the next few months? How can we just kind of keep this momentum if we've got any or refine it, get our running going so that if we do suddenly like, okay, well, you can have a race in six weeks. How can we be there? What can we think about? Not necessarily sessions, but more kind of like mentally how you can keep yourself going out the door because I also find if I stop, if I jump off the training wagon, it's very hard to get back on it because um, if you're a busy person like us, like it's yeah. kind of in your in a, in a timetable. And then if it goes out, something else fills it in. I was thinking about that because uh, it's hard work fitting in all the training with the kids. But I found the last few months, all I've done is envision myself in the summer being strong, being healthy, being outside yeah. um, and doing adventures outside without the focus of this one race. I've just been like, okay, well, when we are released, when we're allowed to travel, I want to be in a position to go. I don't want to be in a position of, I wish I had, uh, and now I've got to do kind of six weeks of base building because oh, I'm not there. Right. That's a big, um, sometimes people ask me why, and just to be ready for that text you might get on a Thursday night saying, do you want to go and do a recce of the old county yeah, top? Yeah, yeah, yeah. To be able to, to, to do that. And I think that's a big, it's a big gift that you can just go, <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to do that. And just to, like you say, you might not have to do sessions, but just keep some kind of consistency. Um, and then, like I say, if you do get the text to go out and do a crazy adventure for a, a full day in the lakes or just something, you can just go, yeah, I'm going to do that. And I often think as well, with the, when the four walls around us at the moment, when we've seen the same visage for a long time, just getting out. I love the feeling. I read a really good book all about 
the coming home was the nicest actual bit of any training, mm-hmm. isn't it? The like actual, I'm done, I'm coming home, I'm taking yeah. my kit off, I'm having a shower, I'm sitting down, I'm having a cup of tea. Yeah. Yeah. So I often think about that when I think, God, I can't, I can't get myself out the door. I think, yeah, but think about, I like, <laughs> my husband and I have this thing called cocktail hour when we oh. put the kids to bed. I know it is not as glamorous as it sounds, but <laughs> we have our special drinks and snacks, congratulate ourselves on getting through another day. And I always think you're going to feel so much better at that cocktail hour, having done your training yeah. and with tired legs than if you get to it and go, I didn't do it. I didn't get it. And we all know as runners that you feel a million trillion times better when you're when you've had oh. some pressure. Sometimes it's a selfish thing being a runner, but I always justify that well. If I didn't run, then I probably wouldn't be as nice to be around to be around. So So I kind of just wanted to sort of touch base with anybody that was feeling a bit like, you know, I'm not you know, maybe I'm not making progress or I'm not following a plan or I've got no race. It doesn't forget all about all that stuff and just focus on being outside, getting the fresh air, getting out of the house, the bit about coming back home and just getting yourself back ready for when we are free, that we can then meet up with mates and go and do crazy stuff or not even crazy stuff, just be fit and healthy enough that you're not going to get injured as soon as you try and ramp up your mileage. But it's not going to be long now, is it? I mean, let's talk crossed. in the UK of coming out of lockdown and... Yeah, sometime in March, hopefully. So what have you got coming up? You talked to me uh, about a session you're going to do tonight. Yeah, five times by five minutes at threshold pace with a minute recovery. So <gasps> very... Oh, only a minute. Cheeky. Oh, yeah, Cheeky. Yeah. It's going to be tough. <laughs> <laughs> do you uh, have a mate that you do that with or do you do it by yourself? Well, this is it. This goes back to kind of what we were just talking about, really, um, because I have struggled with the motivation to do the hard stuff. Um, yeah so hard by yourself isn't it I'm, I've got a friend Justin who um, I need to go to Tesco he works in Hartlepool so we're going to Hartlepool and going to run along the uh, Esplanade whatever it is in, in Seton Crew um, do, do our session there and then I think some kind of threshold session on Thursday with another friend so yeah just trying to buddy up and in England at the moment you I think it's you can only run with one other person so um, as long as you can kind of find somebody who got Goals. You pick and choose according to your session, do you, Gary? Yeah, like, you yeah, can come yeah. on that one. You can come on that one. When you do your threshold and stuff, do you go on perceived exertion or do you look at your heart rate? Heart rate, stuff. Yeah, I, I, I know because I've, I've got the, the Jack Daniels formula and stuff like that. So I know roughly from where I'm at physically what pace I should be running. But I'll always have my heart rate strap on um, just to kind of double check. Because you could be ill, you know, you could have a, something that you're not really... And displaying symptoms, say a cold or, for, or something like that. So the heart rate straps are good. And that northern wind, Gary. Oof. Well, I've already, it's a southerly today, so it's quite mild, but I know I'm doing the five minutes with the southerly wind on my back. I'm not doing it. <laughs> I've planned it all out. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. You know, I do, I do most of my winter training, all, all that, all this volume I'm doing on via heart rate, because it just goes... I I am uh, probably 99% of us go too hard otherwise yeah I need to rein it back in you're a coach you should I know I know it isn't um it's not the running so much I find more the cross training actually harder to the perceived exertion is hard to get the right level because you're like running you're kind of running easy and styled in from 20 plus years of running and but I find I'd actually need my heart rate monitor to dictate and the cross training because I haven't quite yeah I'm like this feels really hard I look, I'm like oh it's not as hard as it <laughs> I take the dog the dog comes with me for the easy runs um and he's brilliant because well we can go from say a seven minute mile and then he'll put the brakes on immediately and just <laughs> sniffing for a minute so the average pace over the run could be like 12 minute mile it's brilliant um, do you have him on the lead or does he run free yeah he's got like a leash that goes on my waist fantastic and it really does help slow you down yeah I've got I run with my two dogs 90% not a session because they drive me mad because of one is a German short head pointer one year old mad I mean she is mad and so she loves nothing better she runs about 200 meters ahead and my other dog just runs by my heels beautifully trained like the first child immaculate second child (laughs) terrible and my pup runs ahead about 200 meters ahead and then does that crouch down and yeah. waits and then runs for us at top speed and like let's go so my my yeah. pace is like five minute mile 15 minute mile <laughs> and I'm like Whoa! dogs are brilliant dogs dogs I just love it I love taking the running I love yeah. their company 
I, I never wanted a dog. I was the only one in the house that didn't want to get a dog. And Rex and I, we were like the best buddies now. Um, oh. so it's really good. We share. You have to share. You have to share a picture of Rex. Okay, we'll do that. <laughs> right. So we look forward to next week. We'll get back on the interviews this week. We've got a busy, um, busy few weeks coming up and lots of things to post. So take a look out on Facebook, Instagram, join our Strava Club and look forward to hearing how everybody's doing. That was episode 25 of Run to the Hills. I'm Eddie Sutton. And I'm Gary Thwaites. And let's run, run to the hills. To the hills.